Good morning. The scripture for today's sermon comes from Psalm 23, 1 through 6. The word of God speaks to us like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. This is the very word of God to us. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Shelby. You guys can sit down and uh, let's ask for God's help as we turn to his word. And uh, you pray for me, I'll pray for you, and we'll see what the Lord has. So, um, Father, we do ask that you would speak to us through your word. We, um, we thank you for the truth that you've not left us to um, wonder about who we really are and who you really are, but you've spoken to us through your word. You speak to us even now through your word. And so would you do that? Um, God, you say that your word is living and that it's active. And um, what we want today is not so much uh, for us to read your word, but for your, read, your word to read us. And so would you do that? And Spirit of God, we, um, we acknowledge that we can't see, hear, or understand without your help, and so would you help us? Would you make Jesus um, even bigger to us today than he was when we walked in this room? It's in your name, Christ, that we pray. Amen. Um, so Psalm 23, definitely the most recognizable psalm in the Bible. Um, I, I think even if you come in here, and maybe you're here today, and you're like, I have never been in church in my life. I've never opened the Bible. I've never read a bit of it. Um, thank you for being here. And I would guess that even you were like, oh, yeah, Psalm 23. Okay, I, I know that one. The Lord is my shepherd. You're like, my, my grandma had it on a quilt and, uh, or on a coffee mug. And yeah, I've seen that. I, I, I've heard that. Uh, even if you didn't grow up in the church, you're familiar with it. We have been in this series in First and Second Samuel called Warrior Poet, where we're exploring the life of King David. And um, so far, this series has been all warrior and no poet. You know, so we've seen like last week, David kill Goliath and cut his head off. And we saw Saul fighting the enemies of God. And there's been a lot of warrior and, um, and almost no poet. And uh, we're going to look at this psalm from David this week. And um, what we've got to acknowledge is um, Psalm 23, I think the picture we get when we hear Psalm 23 feels very separate from the lives that we live. Because if you're anything like me, you hear Psalm 23 and you picture this like serene, beautiful moment with this nice little sheep there. Maybe like, maybe your grandma and them had those little precious moments figurines. I, I don't know if you've seen these. If you've not, good, probably good for you. Uh, but, Dave, you know, there's a precious moments figurine of David and he was like a really cute little boy and there's a little sheep around him and that's what you think like Psalm 23 oh that's so cute but I have real things going on in my life so Psalm 23 isn't much of a help to me um, Psalm 23 actually in a really powerful way speaks to the realities of our lives it speaks to our anxieties to our insecurities it speaks to our fears Psalm 23 speaks to the question that whether or not we acknowledge um, we all have that question Am I enough? Like, am I enough? Am I really going to make it? Am I going to be okay? And so Psalm 23 is written by King David, and we don't know exactly when. There's been a lot of conjecture trying to figure out. There's, there's some of the Psalms that David wrote that we know exactly the moment he's writing it around. Psalm 23, we're not sure. It could have been when David was a shepherd before he was king, and he's thinking about, this is what my relationship with the Lord is like. The Lord is my shepherd. Um, it could have been uh, during the moment where David had been anointed by God as king, but hadn't been recognized by the people as king yet. So he spends a lot of years where God has anointed him as king, and Saul's like, not so fast, homeboy. 
and uh, he's not a big fan of David, and it could have been during then. David could have written it when he's an old king, and he's reflecting on his life with the Lord. It, it's not so important to figure out exactly when David wrote it. What's important is to recognize that it, it introduces us to themes and uh, things that will come up over and over and over again in the life, uh, in the life of David. And it's why we're looking at certain psalms that were written by David, because they provide some color to his life. So if we only look at First and Second Samuel, and we're looking at David the warrior, or David the guy who's running from Saul, or David the king, or David who offers a really weird bride price for, for his first bride, like, if we look at all that, we're left to kind of wonder, what, like, what I love about David also being a poet is we're not left to wonder how did the experiences of his life shape his inner being? How did he actually process what was going on in his life? And we see it in Psalm 23 and in other Psalms. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Psalms, these are 150 individual Psalms, all collected in a book, the book of Psalms, that are the prayer book for the people of God. Um, the people of Israel would have and still do today um, pray the Psalms, and they would sing the psalms together. So they would use the psalms not just individually in their prayer life with God, but together corporately as they gathered with the people of God. And what you have in a unique way in the psalms is it gives language to the human experience. So there's moments in your life, maybe right now, where you feel overlooked by God and by people. The psalms are going to actually give you language to express that to God. There may be times in your life where anxiety and insecurity feels like it's ruling the day and you're not sure you're going to make it through that moment in your life. The Psalms give language for that. There may be moments where you are angry at people who have betrayed and who have wronged you, who have turned their backs on you. The Psalms give language for that. There be, may be moments where you feel like God has forgotten you and he's done with you. David is going to say, let me give language to you to express that. To God. So here's my invitation today as we look at this psalm. I want to encourage you to read it with fresh eyes. Um, I'm going to preach it from a different translation than we normally use. I'm going to preach it from the New Living Translation. And I think that'll help us maybe read it with fresh eyes because you may be here and you're like, oh, I know this, man. I know it in the King James Version or the New American Standard. Or I'm like, man, sometimes we come in here and I, I don't know what's going on, but I know Psalm 23, so I'll check out today and I'll check back in when I, there's something I don't know. Um, there's a real risk for what's familiar to us to grow common. We're very familiar with Psalm 23, and it can become common and not inspire awe in the way that David intends it to. So what David does in this psalm is he reflects on his relationship with God, and he offers us two different metaphors for how he experiences God. And the first is God as a caring shepherd, and the second is God as a gracious host. God is a caring shepherd, and then God is a gracious host. And the big idea today I want to offer to you in the form of a question. I want to ask you to consider the question, do you really believe that you have in this moment all that you need? This is how David opens the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. And it invites us to say, could I agree with David right now at this moment in my life? I have all that I need. Okay? So first metaphor, God is your caring shepherd. Verses 1 and 2, I want you to see God's a caring shepherd who provides for his sheep. He's a caring shepherd who provides for his sheep. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. So when David introduces this metaphor, he's saying in his relationship with God, he is like a sheep and God is the shepherd. If you're not familiar with sheep, I mean, it's easy, I think, sometimes when we talk about this to be like, dude, sheep are dirty, and they're dumb, and they're idiots, and they're stupid, and they don't know anything, and like, okay. What David's trying to communicate is that sheep are very dependent. Sheep are not the type of animals that they just roll out on their own. They can take care of themselves, and they exist in a wolf pack and all that stuff. No, no, no. Sheep are dependent on the shepherd. If you come across sheep, and you don't find a shepherd, you know that the sheep aren't going to be around for very long. Right? David's saying, this is how my relationship with God is. Now, I know as I introduce this metaphor, there's some of you guys who bristle at it. I'm like, I don't like this. I ain't no sheep. I'm a sheep dog. <laughs> you can be a wolf. You can be a sheep. You can be a sheep dog. Not a wolf, not a sheep. I'm a sheep dog. Okay. 
high speed. Calm down for just a second, okay? We're not talking Tim Kennedy or American Sniper. We're talking biblical metaphor here. I would also offer to you that if you refuse to view yourself as a sheep, it's probably why you're stuck in life. It's probably why you're stuck in life because there's a metaphor that David's going to hold out and that God's going to hold out that if we're like, I'm not a sheep, I don't want to be a sheep, I think it's one of the reasons so many of us get stuck in life. And we aren't, like, when we think sheep shepherd, because we're not familiar with Near Eastern shepherding, we, t- we tend to think, like, cute, white, bouncy, happy, cuddly little sheep. And that's what makes so many people bristle at it. They're like, ugh, it just feels weird. I'm a cuddly little sheep, and Jesus is going to... And all the paintings of this passage are just super weird. Jesus is, you know, like this Aryan white guy with nice blonde hair, and, you know, you're like, sheesh, man, feminine Jesus, I'm not a big fan of, I don't like this metaphor, let's move on to something else. Um, That's not so much how we are. We're not the cuddly sheep that are like, we love Jesus, and we just want to snuggle with Jesus. We're like, uh, there's this video that I saw, maybe you've seen it, that's like, uh, it's a little clip that's like, this is actual footage of Jesus saving me, and all you see is this ditch, and then a sheep with these like two legs stuck up, and the shepherd's like pulling the sheep out, and he pulls the sheep out, and the sheep takes two bounces and goes right back into the ditch, right? That's how you are. That's how I am. We need a shepherd because left to ourselves, we're like, this is a nice ditch. Maybe it'll be better than the last time I got stuck in it. Right? Is that not the reality of our lives, right? We're like, dude, that ditch really did me dirty the last time I was there. Maybe this time it's better. Maybe I'll go dive in it again this time. Now, that's how, that's how we are as sheep. Now, I also want you to remember, especially if you're like, I don't want to be a sheep. David is king as he's reflecting on this. He's king. And for David as king to say, I am a sheep, the Lord is my shepherd. Like in the nation of Israel, God had commanded that the king was to be a shepherd to his people. And a shepherd needs a shepherd. And so like there's nobody who's beyond this. You don't grow beyond the metaphor of like, okay, I finally made it in my life and now I'm just a shepherd to God's sheep. David's king, he's shepherd and the shepherd needs a shepherd. Um, Notice even in these these first two verses where they are. So it's a place of peace. He's saying, hey, he, he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. And I want you to picture where David is both geographically and in proximity to the Lord. He's saying, in this peaceful place, the Lord is out in front of me. He's he's actually leading me to the places of peace that I need to go to. It's not the sheep that's out there, and he's being driven by the shepherd. Jesus is actually out there. The Lord is out there leading David. That's that's how he's saying this. Now, I want to shift the language on us, because David says that the Lord is my shepherd. He doesn't say God is, is the shepherd, which is true. He doesn't say God is like a shepherd, which is true. He doesn't say, hey, people of Israel, the Lord is your shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. So let me change the language on us a little bit. The second thing I want you to see is that God's a caring shepherd who strengthens and guides you. Because again, it's easy to think about this for other people. Oh yeah, man, the Lord's her shepherd. The Lord's his shepherd. He's got it together totally, not me. No, God's a caring shepherd who strengthens and guides you. Look at verse 3. David says, he renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name or for the sake of his name. Um, David's recognizing in his life that God gives him strength where his strength runs out. That David, like you and I, goes through moments in his life where he feels like, I don't have what it takes to get through this. I'm not strong enough in this moment to lead my wife, to lead my family in the way that I need to. I'm not strong enough in this moment to lead in the, in the ways that I'm supposed to. I'm not strong enough to get through this moment. David is saying, hey man, the Lord's a good shepherd. He'll lead you. And not just he'll lead you, he's gonna actually renew your strength. He guides you. Like here's the thing about sheep. They don't know where to go. If you like just let a sheep out and you're like, hey buddy, live your best life. True life is found in total freedom. Just choose your own path. That sheep is going to end up eaten or stuck in a ditch. And David's saying, what I don't need 
is total freedom where God's like, choose your own adventure, choose your own path. David's able to recognize, I don't choose very well. But he's able to say, actually, God's out in front of me, showing me the path. He's guiding me along the path because he's a, he's a caring shepherd who strengthens and guides you. Verse 4, we see that God's a caring shepherd who's present with and protects you. He's present with and protects you. He says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, or your translation may say through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. David recognizes the presence of God not just in the peaceful moments of his life, but in the very dark, the darkest moments of his life. David's able to say, hey God, you're not just with me in these moments where I, where I feel like I'm in these nice meadows and I'm beside a peaceful stream. You're with me when I feel like I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, the darkest moments in my life. Um, some of you guys know my little girl, Audra, who's eight, and the bedtime routine with her has always been um, it's been awesome and overwhelming because she's very particular about the order of bedtime. Yeah, we have to say certain things in a way and pray at this moment and then sing a song at this moment and then like her blankets have to go on her in the correct order because she's, she's like, sensory, sensory, dad, sensory issues, you know, and I never remember the correct order. But there's always, um, there's always two things that happen as we're done with however long that routine takes. She asked me to close her closet door because the closet door represents fear and the unknown. It's like that place feels safe during the day, and at night, that's where monsters hide, and just close the door, out of sight, out of mind. I don't even want to think about it being there. She asked me to do that, and then she asked me if I would keep her door open, cracked a little bit, and my door open. And my little girl, man, at nighttime, she develops like superhuman hearing. Um, I prefer to sleep with the door closed, because I'm like, I want to I know somebody's coming into my room. So, I, you know, like, I prefer to sleep with the door closed. She wants it open. And even if I'm like, okay, she's in bed now. Let me lightly close this. I'll hear her feet pitter-patter. And she's like, Daddy, you close the door. She wants the door open because she knows if she can hear me and I can hear her, she's safe. David is saying, even in these moments of darkness, where I maybe figuratively <laughs> don't know what's behind this closet. I know that God is with me. God hears me. God's going to care for me. This is what he's saying in this verse. Now, notice also the geography has changed from verses 1 and 2. So it's no longer a peaceful meadow and, um, and relaxing streams of water. Now it's the darkest valley. But it's not just the geography that's changed. The proximity of God has changed. In verses 1 and 2, peaceful meadow, where's God? He's out in front leading David. In the darkest valley, where's God? He's right beside David. And that's really important. Because God is just as present in the dark valley of your life as he is in the peaceful meadow of your life. In fact, I think David's offering to us, God is actually more present in the darkest valley than he is during times of peace. Now, I wonder how long it took David to come to this realization. Because you're gonna, we're gonna preach through Psalms where it's like, whoa, David's in a dark valley, and he's like, God, why have you forgotten me? Why have you abandoned me? He's looking back on these moments and saying, you know what? I lost sight of God because he wasn't in front of me anymore. He was right beside me in that moment. He was right beside me in this dark moment. Your emotions, your fears, your insecurities, the question, am I enough? Those aren't your shepherd. God is. And what David is inviting us to do is to experience God as this good shepherd. He, he's writing this psalm just as much for his own soul as he is for the people of God. See, David isn't writing Psalm 23 because he's graduated. He's not writing it because he's like, okay, now, now I never have another valley moment. I never have a moment where I feel like God isn't with me. He's writing this psalm, I would bet, so that the next time he's in the dark valley, he can come back to it and say, God has been with me. He will continue to be with me. He's given himself language to process in those 
dark moments as well. God is your caring shepherd. Now the metaphor shifts in verse 5 and 6. God's your caring shepherd, verses 1 through 4, but in verse 5 and 6, David introduces us to God as a gracious host. He's not just your caring shepherd, but he's your gracious host. And he's a gracious host who provides for, who honors, and who blesses you in the midst of adversity. So look at what he says in verse 5. He says, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Um, one of our favorite things to do, our lives are a little gnarly right now, Chris and I, um, but one of our favorite things to do is to have people over for dinner. And I love, I love when people are like, what can we bring? And we're like, just you. Just bring yourself. Everything will be ready for you. All you need to do is sit down at the table. David is saying, this is how God is with me. He prepares a feast. Now notice, David's not like, God prepares a feast and I bring the wine, or God prepares a feast and I bring the side dish, or I bring the salad that no one's going to eat, or the vegetable tray. Like, he's not saying that. David doesn't bring anything to the table. He's saying, um, in the presence of my enemies, God prepares a table for me. He's saying, like, I get there, I bring nothing to the table, I just show up and God has made it ready for me, and he does it in the presence of my enemies, which is fascinating because it's a crazy place to eat a meal. It's a crazy place to eat a meal. Maybe, you, maybe some of you guys, like, have been in combat, and I'm guessing in the midst of that, you never had a moment where you're like, hey, dude, let's set up a table and let's eat a meal together. Like, let's just call a timeout. Let's have this meal here. You do not, that's why this psalm can feel so distant from us, so detached from us, because you're like, dude, who eats in the presence of their enemies? Those who have defeated those enemies do. This is actually God mocking your enemies to say, in the presence of your enemies, I'm going to spread a table. Meals during this time, they didn't have any fast food restaurants. Meals took a lot of time, and you would sit down at the table for hours. So this wasn't like, oh, dude, let's, let's have a quick meal before the Taliban reloads and comes back. That, that's not what he's saying. He's like, no, no, no. They're defeated. And I'm actually going to put them to shame by preparing a table for you in their presence. Your great enemies, sin, Satan, and death, have been defeated by God. And David's saying, what God does is he actually prepares this feast for me. But not just that, um, God honors David. The, uh, to, to anoint someone with oil, th there's been a lot of books written about this passage where we, we, I think people take the shepherd and shepherding metaphor too far, and they're, they're like, well, you know, sometimes a shepherd would pour, would pour oil all over a sheep's head, and that would protect them from flies and all that stuff. Like, I, what David's clearly saying here is that, that God honors him by anointing his head with oil. Anointing someone's head with oil during this time was a symbol of God's presence and power. It was God saying to David, you're mine, and I'm yours. And he's doing that in the presence of his enemies. And not just that, God is your gracious host. He blesses you in the midst of adversity. He says, hey, my cup overflows with blessing. And David's so intentional. This is actually what I love about poetry. Like He's not like, um, I've got a lot of your blessing, God, thank you. He says, my cup overflows. It's almost too much for me. God's not stingy in how he pours his blessing out. He's not like, let me just give you enough to get through today. Let me just give you a little bit right here. David's able to reflect on moments of his life and say, actually, God blesses me in a way that's it's almost too much. Like, God, as I look back, and, and here's the reality. The blessing of God is way clearer in the rearview mirror than it is coming through the windshield. Through the windshield, you're like, dude, everything's a mess and the car's probably going to crash. It's through the rearview mirror that you're like, oh, that moment where I thought I was alone, where I didn't know if I was going to make it, I'm seeing now how God's hand was there. Oh, that moment where God slammed this door closed in my face that felt like everything in my life was going to fall apart. God was actually graciously closing that door because he had a different blessing for me over here. David's able to reflect and to see and to recognize that. God's your caring shepherd and your gracious host. In the invitation of Psalm 23 to us, what we're invited to do is to be content and to trust God. He's your caring shepherd. 
He's your gracious host. He blesses you. And so David ends this psalm in verse 6 and says, Hey, surely, because God is my shepherd and my host, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me, will chase after me, will hunt me down all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. So why are you so discontent? Like, hey, me too. This is what makes Psalm 23 feel like such a cutesy passage. Because you're like, okay, the invitation is to be content, trust the Lord, he's my shepherd, don't really experience that. He's my host, the table, I don't see where that is, hasn't been prepared for me. Why are we so discontent? There is a massive distance, it feels like, between what David is inviting us to in Psalm 23. God's your shepherd and your host, be content and trust him and the reality of our lives so often. Because to come back to that question, do you have all that you need? I'm guessing if you answered honestly, you probably were like, nope, and if you actually knew me, you would know that too. My life hasn't turned out the way that I thought it was. My job isn't nearly what I thought it was going to be, what I was after. My marriage is not the one that I dreamed of. My family doesn't look like what I want to or what I thought it was going to look like. My relationships that I thought were going to be with me forever, they're no longer here anymore. Like, no, I don't have all that I need. That list goes on and on and on. My dreams, my failures. There's a gap between David's experience of God as shepherd and host in the experience of what you may have in your life. And it's what makes this psalm feel so distant to us. Or maybe not be the one that we turn to during moments of anxiety, fear, doubt, questioning God, wondering, are you going to make it? Are you enough? So here's what I want to ask you to do. If you have a Bible, keep your finger in Psalm 23, and let's head to Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4, um, verses 10 through 13, that's the New Testament um, parallel to Psalm 23. So you have Psalm 23 in the Old Testament. Philippians 4 in the New Testament is the parallel to this passage. And in Philippians, Paul is writing to this church that he really loved in this area of Greece. And he's writing to them. He says this in verse 10. He says, hey, I, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. Paul's like, dude, I'm so grateful for you guys. You cared about me so much that you were actually bummed out that you didn't have the opportunity to care for me. The church at Philippi started to feel some serious anxiety for Paul. And I'll tell you why they felt that in a moment. But they started to feel some serious, like, gosh, we got to take care of Paul. We don't even have the opportunity to do it. Is Paul going to be okay? And this is what Paul says in verse 11. Hey, I don't say this out of need. For I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. He's like, guys, don't, don't worry about me. I've learned to be content. I know how to make do with little. I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. Now, here's the interesting thing about Paul. He's writing this from a Roman jail cell. Which during that time, that's not like, um, it's, not, it's not like our jails here. It's like three hots and a cot. Okay, you know, different type of thing. Uh, m- lots of people didn't survive the imprisonment in a Roman jail cell. In fact, the next time, a handful of years from now, Paul's going to get arrested again because he kept saying this crazy thing in the empire of Rome that there was a, a true king and it wasn't Caesar, it was Jesus. And they were like, stop saying that. We're going to put you in jail. And he's like, okay. Um, He's going to be thrown in jail and he'll be put to death for it. So this is not Paul in some ivory tower. This is not Paul like, yeah, of course, Paul, like your life's great. Everything's up and to the right. Of course, you can be like, I've learned the secret to contentment. Everything's great. Paul's saying, hey, dude, whether I'm shipwrecked and cast on an island, or I'm living in a great house in Jerusalem, whether I've got nothing to eat, I don't know where my next meal's coming from, or I'm good to go, there's money in the bank account. He says, I've learned the secret to to contentment. I know what it is 
And he says in verse 13, the verse that's notoriously ripped out of the context of this, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. So he's saying like, hey, I, I, I have everything that I need. I'm content. This is why I say this is the parallel to Psalm 23. Paul's saying the same thing David is. I have everything that I need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And again, he's saying this while he's in jail. He's not saying this like, these prison doors are going to open and I'm going to be okay. In fact, Paul doesn't know in this moment if he's going to live. He's trying to comfort the Philippian church who are really worried about whether or not Paul's going to be okay. And he's going to say, however this turns out, I'm okay because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So this is not the like poster of a four-year-old kid with a basketball looking at a basketball hoop like, I can dunk. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Some of you are maybe realizing this moment. Oh, shoot. I have that tattooed on me, and it's tattooed on me out of context. Like, it's okay. Jesus' grace will we'll cover it. Um, but he says, I've learned the secret, and this is why. This is why. This secret is why David can say at the end of Psalm 23, hey, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. That word translated unfailing love, maybe in your translation is, is translated steadfast love. When that word comes up, steadfast love of the Lord in your Bible, um, it's a covenantal love. Uh, the Hebrew word is chesed. It, it's, it's a covenantal love. It's the way that God loves. And there's a bit of a problem, though, <laughs> because you and I are covenant breakers, not covenant keepers. God has said in the Old Testament, and this is the great question of the Old Testament, like God has said, hey, I'm going to be your God. You'll be my people. Here's how I'm going to love you. Here's how you need to respond. And the problem is one party is really faithful in keeping their side of the covenant, and one is not so much. And you and I are on the, the not so much side. We're covenant breakers, not covenant keepers. We're those who love other things rather than the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So for us to take verse 6 of Psalm 23 to our lips by ourselves and say, God, surely your steadfast, your covenantal love will pursue me all the days of my life ought to make us say, uh-oh, I don't know if I want that because I'm not holding up my end of the covenant. We need to come back to Philippians. Because you're going to hear often, like, context is king. You understand Philippians 4.13. Read what's before it. Read what's after it. Read it. Read it. Read it. Because Paul has actually told us in chapter 3 what the secret is. Because I think if we're honest, we can read Philippians 4 and be like, okay, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does that mean? What, how, what does that mean? I can do all things? Does that mean everything in my life is going to turn out okay? That if I can take it, I can make it? If I just claim that as my truth, then I'm good to go. I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then a passage like that becomes a fanciful thing that we'll put on a coffee cup, but speaks no truth into the reality of our lives because we're like, yeah, but there's a lot of things I haven't been able to do. And I have claimed that verse over my marriage, over my family, over my job, over my bank account. And I've got a whole lot of failures behind it. Well, we got to keep reading. Because Paul told us in chapter 3 what that secret is. So he's not saying, I've learned the secret. See if you guys can find it. <laughs> he's told us. Chapter 3, he begins that chapter, and he lays out like we all do the, our human resumes. We're like, hey, guys, this is the reason that I matter. I'm from the right family. I went to the right school. I got the right job. I was promoted ahead of my peers. I, 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 I. And Paul lays all that out. I had the right job. I was from the right tribe, from the right family. And he says in verse 7, Everything that was gained to me, which is all the stuff that we would say, look at me, I'm important. He says, everything that was gained to me, I've considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value. So, so he, he's saying, everything's a loss in view of something that's actually way more valuable to me. And this is what it is. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things. And he is literally in a Roman prison at this moment. So he has actually lost everything. And I consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness. Righteousness is a word that means right standing with God. 
not having a right standing with God of my own from the law. Paul's saying, my standing with God is not because I did everything I was supposed to and I avoided doing the things that I wasn't supposed to do. He says, a right standing with God that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Hey, only Jesus can take Psalm 23 to his lips and it actually be a comfort to him. Because Jesus is the only truly righteous man who has ever lived. So Jesus can say, hey God, surely your unfailing love, your steadfast covenantal love will pursue me all the days that I live because Jesus has upheld his end of the covenant. He loved the Lord, his God, with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, loved his neighbor perfectly as himself. He's good with God because of his righteousness. And what Paul says, because Paul, like you and I, is a covenant breaker, not a covenant keeper, Paul says, hey, my only hope, the thing that I'm banking my life on, the only thing that gives me true contentment is being found in Christ and having a right standing with God based not on what I've done, but based on what Christ has done in my place. That's what faith is, to believe that Christ has done what you were supposed to do but are unable to do, and he's done it in your place, and his right standing with God is now your right standing with God because of what he's done, not because of what you've done. And Paul says that's the secret to contentment. That's why we can say, surely his goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I'll live in the household of the Lord forever. Like we're cooking with peanut oil now. That's what it is. That solves the tension, the tension of like, how is Psalm 23 a comfort to me? Because I'm a covenant breaker, not a covenant keeper. The tension is solved in Jesus, who's a covenant keeper in our place, and his right standing with God is given to you and I as covenant breakers. So, Psalm 23 can be a comfort to us in our anxieties, our fears, the times where we feel like, I think I've gone too far and God is going to once and for all turn his back on me. It can be a comfort to us only in Jesus. Only in Jesus is God your shepherd who cares for you, who leads you, guides you, protects you, is present with you. And only in Jesus is God your gracious host who prepares a table in the presence of your enemies and he's beside you in the peaceful streams of life and in the darkest valleys of life. And so because of that truth, if you're a follower of Jesus, you can say, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is the invitation. Truly, I have all that I need. He who did not spare his own son, how will he not graciously give us all that we need? If God is for me, who can be against me? If God mocks my true enemies, sin, Satan, and death, truly I have all that I need. That's how Psalm 23 can be a comfort to us. Um, let me invite you to stand with me and we're gonna pray and I want to ask as we pray, those who are serving communion to come down front. Um, I'm going to read a prayer over us. This is from Dallas Willard um, from a book of his as he finishes the book. I think it's a fitting end to, for us to pray for Psalm 23. Hey, so Father, would you bring us to the place of peace where we no longer feel a need to defend ourselves? or to worry about who's going to take care of us, or to be recognized, or to get our own way, or to make sure things turn out right. Father, would you free us through the knowledge that because you are with us, working in our lives, we have everything we need. And now with the truth of who you are deeply engraved in our hearts, would you give us the confidence and power to love all who are in our lives just as we are being loved by you freely, fully, joyfully? Let your spirit move in our minds and hearts so we believe ever more fully that because you are our all-sufficient shepherd, we shall never want. 
We ask all this because we would have it no other way. Amen.